What's going on all my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. Today we are continuing on with the cardiovascular assessment and electrocardiogram like a boss series and we're going to be discussing atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. Before we begin, I want you to take a look up here on the right side of your screen. You're going to see two different sets of stoplights. Our first set of stoplight is going to tell us about our rhythm. Is it a good rhythm? Is it a rhythm we should be cautious about? Or is it a lethal rhythm? Those not really good rhythms. And our next one is going to be either a green person letting us know that we can play our monopoly game, collect our $200 and keep going, or it needs to be red, stop, we need to do something about this before it gets worse. So we begin with atrial flutter. The atrial rate will be between 220 to 350 beats per minute. The rhythm will be regular and P waves will be replaced with flutter. That's what you see down here in the example. It's that sawtooth-like appearance. The PR intervals will be non-discernible and the QRS intervals should still remain normal. The definition is a rapid firing of atrial impulses causing rapid atrial rhythms such as flutter. The ventricles may contract on every second to fourth beat causing an irregular rhythm such as a two to one, three to one, and four to one. So causes for atrial flutter include hypoxemia, digitalis toxicity, pulmonary embolism, atrial enlargement could be a big one, mitral tricuspid valve disease, atrial septal defects, pericarditis, core pulmonale, hyperthyroidism, and chronic lung diseases. It can often occur in people after open heart surgery, which is my background. So interventions that we're looking at with these patients, they can look at calcium channel blockers such as deltiazem, synchronized cardioversion, beta blockers, and a new one for us, antiarrhythmics such as digoxin. So let's talk about deltiazem. So we use this to control ventricular rates in atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, and it's used after adenosine to treat refractory SVT with adequate blood pressures. So with dosing, an acute rate is gonna be between 15 to 20 milligrams IV over two minutes. We could give another IV dose in 15 minutes at 20 to 25 milligrams over two minutes as well if it's needed. Maintenance infusions will be between five to 15 milligrams per hour and we titrate based on the heart rate. Normally this medication is diluted in either D5W or normal saline. Lastly, considerations we might want to consider is we don't want to use calcium channel blockers in the presence of poison, drug-induced tachycardia, Wolf-Parkinson's white syndrome, plus a rapid atrial fibrillation and flutter, sick sinus syndrome, or AV block without pacemaker. And we also want to avoid in patients receiving oral beta blockers as these calcium channel blockers can make it worse. So synchronized cardioversion is so much fun, not for the patient, but for you. So it involves the delivery of a low energy shock, which is timed or synchronized, to be delivered at a specific point in the QRS complex to avoid causing ventricular fibrillation. So how do we do this procedure? We're gonna obtain a 12 lead ECG if the patient is stable. We are not going to delay cardioversion if the patient is unstable because we're waiting on a 12 lead ECG. So if they're stable, get the 12 lead ECG. We're gonna prepare proper sedation since cardioversion is extremely painful and have emergency equipment nearby in case of complications. We wanna place the defibrillator pads on the patient and set the monitor to synchronized or sync mode. Sync mode will deliver a concurrent energy with each QRS. We want to engage the sync mode before each attempt and we want to look for those sync markers that are going to be above each R wave. So what do our voltage dosages look like? So the initial recommended voltage doses for narrow regular is between 50 to 100 joules for our SVT or atrial flutter. Our narrow irregular rhythms are going to be between 120 to 200 joules if we're using a biphasic defibrillator or 200 joules for a monophasic defibrillator. We see this most with our atrial fibrillations. Wide regular 
is going to be 100 joules used for our monomorphic ventricular tachycardias and our wide irregular rhythms are just going to be using our defibrillation doses. We're not going to be looking at synchronized cardioversions. We're just going to be defibrillating those shockable rhythms. We want to clear our personnel from the patient prior to giving the shock and we're going to press the charge button. We're going to announce clear the patient. Once we know that the people that are helping us with this patient are clear, they're not touching the patient, they're not touching the bed, we don't want to shock anybody who doesn't need to be shocked, we're going to press the shock button. After we press that shock button, we're going to reassess our patient's rhythm on the monitor and make a determination if additional doses are needed. So let's talk about our beta blockers. So beta blockers can convert to normal sinus rhythm or to a slow ventricular response, or it can do both. It is a second drug of choice after adenosine, and it reduces myocardial ischemia and damage in acute myocardial infarction patients with elevated heart rates, blood pressure, or both. Beta blocker dosing is different depending on the medication. Let's begin with propanolol. It can be between 0.5 to 1 milligram over one minute and can be repeated as needed up to 0.1 milligrams per kilogram as a total dose. Esmolol is 0.5 milligrams per kilogram over one minute, followed by 0.05 milligrams per kilogram per minute for infusions. The maximum dose we want to give is 0.3 milligrams per kilogram per minute, and higher doses really are unlikely to be beneficial. Lastly, labetalol. That it can be given 10 milligrams IV push over one to two minutes, and you could repeat or double every 10 minutes to a maximum dose of 150 milligrams, or give an initial dose as a bolus followed by an infusion at two to eight milligrams per minute. So consideration with our beta blockers, we do not want to give to patients that are having ST elevated myocardial infarctions if the following presentations such as heart failure, low cardiac output, or increased risk of cardiogenic shock are present. Additional contraindications may include PR intervals that are greater than 0.24 seconds, second degree heart blocks, third degree heart blocks, active asthma, reactive airway disease, severe bradycardia, systolic blood pressures that are less than 100, early aggressive beta blocker treatment can be detrimental in hemodynamically unstable patients, so we don't want to use that, and concurrent calcium channel blocking administration. If you give them both at the same time, it can cause severe hypotension and bradycardia or even potentially heart blocks. So let's look at the antiarrhythmic digoxin. So what digoxin does is it slows down the ventricular response in atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Antiarrhythmic dosing for digoxin, the low dose will be between four to six micrograms per kilogram over five minutes. And second to third doses will be between two to three micrograms per kilogram to follow at four to eight hour intervals. Total loading doses of 8 to 12 micrograms per kilogram is usually divided over an 8 to 16 hour period. We want to check the toxin levels every 4 hours after giving IV doses and every 6 hours after providing oral doses. We want to monitor heart rate and rhythms for any kind of abnormalities and it's also important to note that maintenance doses can affect renal function, so we want to be monitoring those I's and O's. Lastly, we want to give digoxin cautiously when we're also giving amiodarone dosages, because if we are giving both, we need to reduce digoxin dosages by 50%. So some digoxin considerations that you might need to consider when you're providing these medications is toxic effects are common and can be associated with serious arrhythmias. Some of the common themes that you see behind a lot of the arrhythmias we're going to talk about is going to be digitalis toxicity. So we have to monitor their ECG very closely. 
Also, we don't want to provide electrocardioversion in patients receiving digoxin unless it is absolutely necessary and life-threatening. If we do have to give um, cardioversions, then we usually use lesser joules, such as 10 to 20 joules when we shock. Let's look at abutiline, which is another antiarrhythmic also known as covert. It's used for our supraventricular arrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter with durations of greater than 48 hours. They've been experiencing this more than two days. It's effective for conversion of both of those rhythms. In regards to dosing, adults that are greater than 60 kilograms are going to receive one milligram, which is approximately 10 mLs, administered over 10 minutes, and second doses may be administered at the same rate of 10 minutes after the initial dosing. For our adults that are less than 60 kilograms, we give 0.01 milligrams per kilograms, initially IV dose administered over that 10 minute period. Considerations when giving this medication, you do not want to give if the QT interval is greater than 440 milliseconds because that can actually make the QT interval worse. And you may develop ventricular arrhythmias, including torsades de point, especially if there is a left ventricular function impairment present with the patient. Lastly, we're gonna be looking at our atrial fibrillation. Our atrias are just fibrillating, they're not functioning appropriately. So the atrial rate is gonna be greater than 400 beats per minute and the rhythm is gonna be irregularly irregular. The P waves are gonna be hidden in that fibrillation wise, so you're not gonna see P waves. And the PR interval is not gonna be measurable, but the QRS complexes should still be normal, less than 0.12 seconds. Definition for this rhythm is multiple foci firing at repetitive intervals within the atria. The ventricular response is irregular and can cause the heart rate to be greater than 100 beats per minute. So causes of atrial fibrillation include hypoxemia, mitral valve disease, ischemic heart disease, congestive heart failure, cardiomyopathy, hypertension, rheumatic heart disease, as well as our chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. So interventions for atrial fibrillation, there's a lot. One, we can provide oxygen if oxygenation is not adequate, less than 94%. We can do synchronized cardioversion, calcium channel blockers such as deltiazem, beta blockers, our antiarrhythmics can help convert it. And if those don't work, we can look at ablation. That is procedure where we are restoring the normal heart rhythm by destroying abnormal tissue through high frequency electrical energy resulting in scarring within the atria. Lastly, we also wanna consider anticoagulation therapy, for example, aspirin, 81 to 325 milligrams daily if this is gonna be a sustained rhythm because one of the complications of atrial fibrillation is stroke. Those atria are constantly fibrillating, blood sits there, it starts to clot, and if that clot breaks off and goes into our circulatory system, it can easily go to the brain cause an obstruction, and potentially cause a stroke. I hope that this video was helpful in elevating your cardiac knowledge and helping you pass those exams like a boss. Make sure that you check out my website at www.nursechung.com where you can get copies of these resources, the PowerPoints, as well as test questions that I will be including with each one of these videos within the series. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions and make sure you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe and make sure you turn on that notification bell. Until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I can't wait to see you all again soon. Bye.